Indy Johar, I am uh, really looking forward to this uh, this conversation. Likewise, I'm super delighted. And uh, there's so many conversations that we've had, that I think are worth um, putting out into a broader conversation. So I'm really delighted and honored to be, to be here. So thank you, Matt. Yeah. Um, I guess, I, you know, I'd love to just sort of start with some with some basics. Um, uh, why why do you care about the question of ownership? Why do you see it as so uh, so fundamental? I think, uh, uh, well, I think it's a good question to start with. I mean, I think the question of ownership, and this is sort of slightly kind of mm, not radical, but slightly kind of positional, is I would argue that whether you look at capitalism or whether you look at Marxism or whatever. All those things are predicated on theories of property, labor, contract. And the only difference is who chooses, right? So where the choice lies of property, where the choice lies of, mm -hmm. of, um, of labor. And I think one of the interesting questions for me is they are both <laughs> dominated by a theory of dominion of the world. Mm -hmm. They're both dominated by a theory of dominion. Now, I think what's happened is over a course of time that theory of dominion which was at first an embodied dominion i.e your relationship with the things that you owned let's use that landscape was an embodied theory of ownership as people like uh, catherine pistar have elegantly put out we've been coding capital and abstracting capital to the point that we've disembodied theories of ownership theories of labor theories of employment so significantly away from the embodied entanglements of things that they have in the process become problematic domains and those problematic domains have and they in the app and the act of abstraction and the act of delinking them they are creating vast systemic externalities and at the point of that abstraction i think we've also created a problem space which is that our theory of governance which is a means to regulate that abstraction as we slowly disembodied it i would argue as a kind of sort of a, a, sort of an over narrated arc that regulatory landscape has also had to become massively centralized now the capacity to regulate complex situational realities through centralized means of regulation kind of worked as, a, as an illusion in a relatively linear predictable world as the feedback systems became not only apparent but material because the accumulative effects of co2 accumulative effects of ecological destruction became so significant where the feedbacks are no longer material and are starting to feed back as people like daniel schmachtenberg would say feedback into the point of self-termination those micro violences are now accumulatively so significant that they're self-terminating so those two dimensions of both abstraction, disembodiment of, of relationships of um, entangled being that happen through ownership and the abstraction of our coding of capital and our failure to be able to regulate in a complex world have come together to, I think, undermine our current theory of how we relate to the world. Ownership is just a means, it's a, it's a device. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what systemically challenging but not just challenging ownership of things ownership of land and things but it's also challenging i think theories of property i think it's challenging challenging theories of organizing it's challenging what i would argue are the kind of systemic roots that are means of organizing capital whether whether capitalism or marxism doesn't really matter that they're not able to do and i think and they're both functions of what I would call information impossibilities. So they become informationally impossible to regulate and control. And I think we're reaching a moment where that requires us to transcend our theories of property, transcend our theories of labor, transcends our theory of contracting, can transcend our theories of organizing as we've done, uh, or command and control organizing. And to put it into a bigger picture or a sort of macro picture, I would argue this is also part of a theory of control and dominion, control and punishment economies. So we've been built, uh, our economies have been built with theories of, you know, and I think, Matt, I think you said this once, and I think it was even in, in Bellagio, where the kind of, uh, they are largely residual structures of the theory of kingship. And so they're control models and punishment models of our economy. And control and punishment models 
were theoretically okay in a linear predictable world, but in a complex and tangled situational world, they don't work. And and I think what we're seeing is that the kind of end of control is a dominant means of organizing, not just morally. I think morally it's problematic fundamentally for since route one, but perhaps even in terms of efficacy, it's no longer viable. And I think those two things are coming together to be able to challenge that. And I think the final point I'd add is, I think when you add what I would say is a revolution in bureaucracy, which is our shift in bureaucratic capabilities from analog centralized systems to new forms of computational bureaucracy, um, I think that creates a new capacity of bureaucracy to be able to handle a new relational and agentified world. So I think the kind of construct, this is a function of these systemic failures, systemic uh, new capabilities that are coming to the table, and a new theory of organizing warranted by a sort of an increasingly real, real and entangled world. And that's why I think that the theory of property is under challenge and requires renewal. So one thing that I hear in this, which is interesting, and I'm, I'm curious what your what your reaction would be is is that it almost sounds like you're saying and this could be completely wrong this is a gloss which you know please sort of tear it down if it doesn't make sense but i i it almost sounds like there is it almost sounds like a sort of a mirror image of like the of a sort of hayekian critique of a central planning economy it's like almost as though we've gotten to the you know, the opposite of that problem in which it's impossible not to centrally plan the economy, but to centrally regulate the economy. Does that, uh, does that track? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I would argue in our critiques of market, if you look at the centralized production of capital, what is it sort of, I certainly know the stats in the UK, I think it's 97% of capital production is done by four banks. So financial capital production. Yeah. So I would, I would argue Yes, we've not able to regulate, centrally regulate the economy, absolutely. But actually, I would also argue we're not able to centrally resource the economy. And I think the centralization of capital production is also part of the tyranny of that process. And and then I think, but this all relies on seeing the world as resource and units of assets. So it's also a worldview issue, which is if we see the world through a lens of resources and assets, i.e., instrumentalizable things as opposed to agents in the world so in a world of agency and agents it's a fundamental shift at that moment in time so absolutely on the side i i would argue that we've been de facto moving towards a centralized economy without knowing it yeah. um because we couldn't regulate it yeah and um you know you've you've spoken a lot about um the idea of sort of entanglement and of, a, of, a, of kind of taking into our horizon of recognition other kinds of agents. Um, uh, I wonder if you could say a little bit of, a little bit about that, a little bit of sort of about the sort of idea of, uh, of entanglement and what that means for how you think about the individual person and, and also the idea of other kinds of agents because it it strikes me that this dovetails quite importantly with uh with what we've just been talking about regarding sort of uh regulation and resourcing yeah no absolutely so i mean so let's sort of this is caricature-esque but it's illustrative of a purpose if we let's imagine a piece of land the land has a red line boundary or boundary of ownership, which is in a registry. Okay. Now there's a tree on that land. That tree is a cherry tree. That cherry tree actually mutually blossoms with other cherry trees. Mm -hmm. So now if you chop down that cherry tree, you reduce the blossom capacity of the whole system. It's your partial commons thesis in many ways. Or whether if you look at that land, that land is multiple beneficiaries in terms of who who has the right to destroy the soil of that land which has taken 10,000 years to build. Mm 
Right. Or if you look at the water that is actually passing through that land and is actually being purified or contaminated, depending on how that land is used. So that land has many relational um, interdependencies that we basically divide and break up into units of rights and infinite resources that don't recognize their relational interdependencies. And in the process, what I would argue, we reached a tipping point where the impact of all those microviolences. So if you look back at, uh, I think you live in LA, if you look back in Los Angeles in whatever, uh, 1970s, 1970s, the amount of trees in Los Angeles. And if you look at the kind of destruction of trees because of just few planning law changes, which meant that actually those trees were removed, those micro changes have become, those micro rule shifts are becoming so dominant that they've shifted the tree canopy of Los Angeles massively, like massive numbers. So why I use that as an example, you could talk about London's front gardens. The front gardens have been replaced by car parking spaces, and we've lost vast amounts of absorbable land, which was actually absorbing rain and dampening, uh, dampening floodwater risks and other things. So these micro violences, which in themselves are nothing, but cumulatively have systemic effects. And in a way, the challenge for us is that our theory of governance um, is, you know, there's a two way argument here. The one is that our theory of governance is not able to regulate those things. The second point I would argue is that, you know, if you took a more, if you took an alternative perspective on it, you could argue the nature of property um, is so fundamentally regulated that actually there is very little dominion left mm -hmm. and it's poorly regulated so you could make an argument and i think some people would and i want to acknowledge that for the sake of completeness of the debate somebody would say well hold it i can't do anything with my land without some form of permission i can't actually i need to get licenses for construction i need to get actually for sale i need to register the sale uh, for uh, for mortgages, I need to get an insurance. I could give you a full stack of quasi permission systems that are regulating this landscape, which leaves le very little situational um, uh, responsibility. So you could say we've removed the benefits of stewardship because actually we remove the embodied rights and the responsibilities of the system and regulated them. And we've effectively maximized the externalities in the system at the same time. So it's a, it's a double problem that we've reduced inherent governance as well as reduced inherent agency in the system. And I'm using it just as an example to illustrate that I think our theory of divisibility and, you know, to construct a theory of property, you have to be able to objectify something. Then you have to, you know, to give it a boundary, objectify it. You have to then give yourself distance. So you have to create a permission landscape of violence. And this is a cultural thing, like, you know, the, the analogy I use is the construction of perspective in, in many ways, I mean, this, this is arguable, the construction of perspective was a thesis of distancing and objectification, and that objectification mm. and distancing, it permitted a theory of violence, and it also permitted a theory of classification. So you could classify things, you could disentangle things. So this is, we've been living through this kind of worldview paradigm which has engineered vast spaces of violence, but has also engineered vast possibilities of combinatorial possibilities that never existed before. And yeah. I think we have, to, we have to acknowledge both these things. And I think for the completeness of the debate, I think we have to acknowledge those things. And we have to acknowledge that the theory of property has constructed the distribution of wealth and the distribution of power as probably never seen before. So because we've actually distributed <laughs> capabilities of being quasi-sovereigns, I mean, you know, to be um to have the right to vote was uh, originally a construct based on whether you owned your land because it was seen as a fundamental theory of fief fiefdom or you having sovereignty on land and thereby being independent and being sovereign in some thesis so you could argue and the industrial state actually created that theory of sovereignty through other mechanisms and other forms of kind of welfare mechanisms and other things to create a theory of, of synthetic sovereignties. So I do think I don't want to throw the conversation off. I just want to acknowledge what it's done, acknowledge the violence systemically it's created and acknowledge the need for a new paradigm conversation.
which I think is required. And I think this is the work that you know Radical Change and DM have been doing of the, and with Margaret uh, Levy's team and from Stafford have been doing some of this stuff, which I think is really interesting and important. Yeah. And so what, when I when I think about this idea of 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 agents, um, it strikes me well. There's it, there are two important questions that jump out to me. One is the question of how to represent agents, like how agents show up in an institutional way, how they're represented. But I think I sort of want to bracket that one for a second because it, there's an important it, there's an important complementary question which has to do with rights and responsibilities because it it seems to me that you know when we try to imagine um well first of all there's just this sort of important uh distinction between rights and responsibilities that maybe we should like lay a little bit of a little bit of foundation foundation for right so you know for example if you if you think about a um if you think about a uh, medieval sort of system, right? There is a there is a way in which, at least in some ideal sense, the uh, the ruler is supposed to have some responsibility towards the ruled, right? Um, and you you can kind of I, I think you can, uh, and so you know, and that's the responsibility is a very different sort of thing than rights, right? Rights are basically um, you know sort of predefined areas in which the the implication is that you have no responsibility right the 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 wielder of the right has no responsibility within the contours of the right so um so for example um uh when i think about agents being represented like non-human agents being represented in a property system one thing that seems really important to me is you know not only how do we give those non-human agents rights but how do we how do we make them capable of holding us to our responsibilities to them so so yeah, for example, I, does that make sense yeah it totally does i i would say if you look at a legal corporate mm -hmm. a legal corporate has responsibilities so mm -hmm. you could argue the corporate form is a precursor to computational agents so you could argue, and I think this is the way I would construct the debate, is that, you know, we're already living in a computationally designed world. It's called corporate organisms. And now what we're or moving to, and they have responsibilities. So the kind of question is, how is those responsibilities governed, insured, managed? So I, I do think we have, we have um, uh, examples in the current system that do hold those things in a non-human system, right? So a corporate, you could argue, is a legal construct and it does hold responsibility and contracts that responsibility in different formats. The question is, can we be, can we construct those rights and responsibilities in a corporate uh, through a comp computational landscape and what would that do? I think it opens up a really interesting question. And, and what is the extent of rights and responsibilities that can be constructed through computational possibilities? And what is the nature of those rights and responsibilities in terms of their parametric contingent capability, con contingent capacities, and other frameworks that are opening up over there? But I just wanted to say, is there a is there a parallel that we can draw upon, um, and the role of insurance and other things and sort of processes and other forms that we can draw there? Right. Well, for I mean, for example, um, um, one you know one conversation that this maps onto for me is the conversation about about partial common ownership because i mean the, the sort of the idea in partial common ownership is that you can take a, a an asset and sort of split it into two pieces one of which is in the market one of which is non-transferable one of which is very much outside of the market right and the, the one that is outside of the market is uh the idea is that that should be held by um by a um um a network right or sort of a you know a non non individual non economic actor type agent uh to which 
the responsibilities of stewardship or the duties of stewardship are owed. Um, and um, uh, so do you think like, I guess there are two sort of questions here. You know, one is, one is, do you think that, that technologies like AI and better sort of information processing technologies and things like that, do you, I'm curious your thoughts about the potential for those kinds of technologies to represent non-human agents. And then, and then there's sort of a meta question, which is like, how do you, how do you think about the worry of, of um, sort of, um, you know, just creating some other imperfect representation of something that can't quite be perfectly represented? Um, do you think that, do, do you think that it's, uh, you think that the, the steps that we should take are, uh, simply to do the best we can to sort of represent different kinds of, of agents in, in our networks of relationships as best we can and continue to try to improve those representations? Or do you think that there's some sort of uh, fundamental way in which in which that's impossible or it's the wrong route or it's it's dangerous? I mean, there's this is a super hard question, but I'm 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 just curious sort of how you how you think about that. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question, and, and you're right, it's super hard. Um, I think there's there's a couple of premises to it, which I think are kind of worth us digging into. Um, the map the map will never be the terrain. Yeah. So, I think the question for me is always not whether the map can ever become the train; it can never become the train. But when is the map useful? And the second part, so so where is the utility of the map, I think is really important to define. And and then the second part of the question, which I think is e perhaps even more interesting, perhaps, is I, I think sort of, and again, this is slightly controversial, so I accept, you know, critique on this, but m my reading on sort of computational technologies and say, machine assisted decisions and other things is not that machine assisted decisions are bad is just that machine assisted decisions codify our historic biases and replicate those historic biases so if you and actually they tend to be still better than human decisions um because we can actually once we are aware of that codification bias we can actually do something about it uh, so become conscious of our biasing and thereby actively do something about it whereas human systems like you know i think the great example is a judge after 12 o'clock after you know just before lunch was giving very bad sentences just because he would get hungry and so right. his sentence structure was actually really terrible and just by declaring that to his declaring his own bias to him actually allowed him to become an informed agent of change so, you know, what I like about that is that that's an ennobling technology. That's a technology that allows us to recognize our own capacities and actually help us improve us. And I think there's a kind of really interesting role of how we're using decision structures. And are we using them as ennobling technologies? Are we using them as control technologies? Are we using them as scale technologies? And these are fundamentally different types of theories of technology. So I want to just sit there a little bit because I, I do think there's too much um and i do think the theory of technology as an ennobling device is actually very powerful a map which is ennobling as to our behaviors and our conscious behaviors a map that shows us the dependencies of that cherry tree with other trees the map that actually informs us to becoming better agents in relationship is a pretty interesting map thesis and so i i see the map is an ennobling technology as opposed to a control technology and i think often when we think about these landscapes we think about agents as control technologies frameworks as opposed to ennobling technology frameworks so that's one dimension um second dimension i think is that you know you you you, you and you, you'll know this better than i will map but you know right now we can take a piece of land and take uh its environmental services as easements and the rights of those environmental services easements and, and give them to a third party. Uh, that's third party, we can assign those easements in terms of being guardian. 
I think yep. the, the challenge here is, so legally that's a construct that can be done, bit difficult, there's, there's some fiscal friction in there, tax uh, tax friction in there. There is some there's some legal costs in there in terms of being able to construct that. But let's imagine we you know it's legally viable. There's some frictions that need to be resolved, which you can resolve. But the challenge I think, which is more problematic or more difficult, is we're back into centralized ver uh, verification models. So we're back into throwing those easements to a body. And a body which is then having to understand computational positional sort of appropriateness. How do these different easements, the water, the other things, how do they intersect? How do they work together? How do they work together in climate change and microclimates? So the kind of the problem we've, yes, we've made comp computationally smarter with satellite technologies and other things, but we're still in that same paradox of centralized governance problems and not looking at the entanglement problem. And I think this is where I think the role of spatial computing and other things will become critical. And I think ennobling frameworks, if that framework is an ennobling framework, I think it becomes a different type of device rather than a control device. It becomes a kind of an empowerment and, and justice device. And then what are the deep incentives of a system? So, you know, there's a really brilliant, um, yeah, you probably know this, but in uh, Swedish law, I think it was that if the thickness of your soil had increased, your inheritance tax was reduced, if mm. not made zero. Mm. If your thickness of soil had gone down, then you had an inheritance tax, i.e. you had constructed a liability for future generations. Yeah. Which I th so, so the kind of question that, and even that, you know, do you century tax? That's a really interesting question. I'm really interested in what if there's a, you know, what, what if that land has a, a wallet which means that you've created a deficit against the future in that wallet. So it's not theft centrally accumulated by government, the distributed handover. And if that land is handed over to a third party, you have to make full of that wallet for that handover to occur. So the protocols are agreed, but actually the resource is not centrally allocated and centrally distributed. I think these are the sort of spaces that we need to play in, in terms of ennobling technologies, Fisc distributed fiscal mechanisms and sort of civic and fiscal mechanisms that construct these sort of incentives in different ways. And I'm I'm playing live here in terms of actually just thinking this problem through. Um, but that's where I think we, and that's, that's I think my intuition is moving towards ennobling systems and then distributed incentive systems in a way that actually empower us in deeper ways and invite us to be our better selves. And, you know, Nobody wants to be in societies where we are incentivized to do harm to each other, because you know, in a land of in a land of retribution, there's a land full of blind people, right? So yep. the the question for us is like, how do we create ennobling frameworks which are just? Yeah, I I, I agree. And it, to me, it's about you know, abstraction is like many things, something that we need to sort of find a balance within. You know, we can you you can you can abstract to that there are dangers in abstracting too far and dangers in abstracting too little. Um, and um, uh, I think that that's, um, in, you know, the sort of financialization of everything is a, is a, is a great example of abstracting too far, of, uh, excessive abstraction. And um, uh, I think that, um, it, you know, at least to me, these kinds of, these kinds of new property systems as well as new monetary systems are about, Sort of finding the right level of abstraction to um, 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 to represent to be able to represent a more more harmonious relationships basically between between people and 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 uh, as well as you know non human institutions uh, uh, systems uh, and so on. Um, the you you've. Uh, I've I've heard you express some very interesting ideas about uh, sort of um, uh, embodied information, and the idea that that uh, that there are kinds of information in sort of embodied cognition that um, uh, that are unique that don't find their ways into our at least many of our abstraction systems. So a couple of things. I, I think when I talk about embodied intelligence, it's the recognition that there's the physical um, 
body component of intelligence, i.e. the agent component of intelligence, which is also a key function of how we build that. So our ability to affect the world and see the effects of it and sense the effects of it, that craft loop is actually a theory of intelligence in itself. And then that those dimensions of how we affect the world are multiple. There's a physical dimension, there's emotional dimensions, you could argue there's, there's language, there's all sorts of different ways that we can actually sort of sensorily engage, react, and embody in those cycles. And then they're also spatially, uh, contextually variant. And that's why I think most of our theory of intelligence has been towards, I think, towards universalized intelligence, single points of truth, single points of proof rather than embodied multidimensional perspectives. So as we talk about multiple currency system, multi-intelligence systems are going to be a key factor. So that's what, and I, and I think it's important at a moment like this, when a type of intelligence is getting so much significant power and we're able to do so extraordinary things with it, that we start to now diversify our thesis to recognize the multidimensionality in terms of actually recognizing what the new human economy. And then thereby, thereby what becomes really interesting is that how can machines play a role to be not control oriented to it, but ennobling frameworks to actually invite us to be actually our fuller, more human selves. And that I think is a different type of symbiotic relationship with machine human systems than theories of control, which actually reduces us to bad robots in a way, rather than actually ennobling us to be extraordinary humans, which are being machine assisted to be even more extraordinary enriching and exploring the full dimension of our capabilities. Um, and that also puts us as agents of craft rather than agents of instru uh, instruction. Um, and I think that's a different type theory of agency. The, the, the big point for me, and it sort of rhymes with everything you said, it's very clear whether we like it or not, our current theory of organizing and governance no longer works. And not marginally doesn't work. It doesn't work to the point of self-terminating us. Right? It's, it's a sort of, it's not like a marginal failure that we just need to correct. It's so systemic and so uh, structural that it is self-terminating us. So unless we can actually change our theory of organizing and move towards ennobling frameworks, move towards actually um, education of the world, which means that we live in treaty and in relationships of care, because that's what the other thing is. When you move from relationships of dominion to relationships of agents, you, become, you move into relationships of care and co-care between environments. And that's a different theory of organizing in the world and it invites a different way of uh, the kind of the contractual frame or the relational frame becomes fundamentally different and people like uh, elizabeth harrell's work on sort of economies of care i think feminist economies conversations come into this in really radical ways as well uh, which i think is really interesting so i think there's a heralding of a different world view in this which i think is really interesting um and i i think we're going to have to look this far into the system um, because I don't think this is a problem of of fixing at the kind of what I'd call who controls problem anymore. Mm -hmm. It's the nature of control that's broken. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great place to to close. Um, as always, great to talk to you, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, um, to continuing to to work on all these things uh, uh, together with you. So um, uh, Honestly, it's a real pleasure, Matt, and uh, thank you for everything that you do, and thank you for everything that Radical Exchange does in building these uh, these landscapes and building these conversation spaces. It's genuinely appreciated.